Big data can be characterized by these five different characteristics that are often present when we work with big data. The first one is the digital footprint. I actually like that word much better than the word big data, especially in the social sciences. That means this digital footprint is produced anyways with every digital step we take is produced for free. And that's what we actually study when we study big data. The second characteristic is that big data is big. So the implication for the social sciences is that we try to substitute the sample, the small n, with capturing the entire universe, the big N. Uh, and there is still a potential bias. Not everybody is on Facebook and not everybody uses the internet with the same intensity. So there are new statistical challenges here, but it doesn't have to do uh, with setting up survey samples. It has to do with a bias in the representation. Sometimes this, this is called volume. There's a big volume of data. Um, then there is data fusion. The fact is that the big data footprint is all always incomplete and unstructured. So we can use different sources to complement these different holes. It's a lot of variety of data. Then big data is often available in real time. And, and, and sometimes we also interested in analyzing the big data footprint in real time. So there's a lot of velocity involved in big data analysis. And last but not least, the idea of machine learning. So once you have enough data, there's no need for theory. Let the algorithms loose, let them find some patterns. And then we just use these patterns to make predictions. Sometimes if you read, read literature about big data, you find these three characteristics, volume, variety, and velocity. I'm personally not very good of coming up with words that start with a V. So if you have a suggestion about the two other words that start with a V that I could use here, uh, please go ahead and, and give me that suggestion. It seems like in the business consulting world, it's, it's important to have some kind of homogeneous uh, reference here to the characteristics of big data. So I'm open for your suggestions. The big data paradigm also opened up several very profound and hotly debated questions. For example, the privacy question that's, that's all pervasive. But another maybe even more profound question is the question of the free will, especially if we do uh, big data in a social science setting. So the idea is if we have now this big, big, big data footprint that allows us to make predictions with 95% accuracy about the behavior of people, where is the free will? I mean, these, these predictions work impressively well with all the data we have, but don't we have a free will? 95% accuracy? It doesn't seem like there's a lot of free will involved. So for example, this headline here made a big splash when they announced that Amazon has started to ship things to you before you even thought of buying them. It's kind of like there's no free will. Even if they ship, well, it sounds a little bit crazy, but think about it. So basically what Amazon does in, in reality is if you've been buying diapers for the last six weeks on Amazon, it's likely you're going to buy diapers again next week and even next month. Even they know which kind of size of diaper you're going to probably buy in three months from now. So what they just do is they already start sending a pack of diapers close to your home. Then of course they charge you for expedite shipping. <laughs> I don't know how that exactly works, but that's kind of like the idea. You know, they save themselves a lot of inventory. They ship it close to you, and then they can just you know drop it off. Now, if you don't buy it, it's also there's a there's a mistake, but they manage it. Then on average, if a town needs a hundred packages of diaper, on average they have a very good estimate. Now, for example, police force also starts to use predictive analytics. For example, the LAPD and uh, the police in Santa Cruz started to use what they call predictive policing. So they take data from crimes, from the weather, from buses, how they drive, from parks, from how people visit parks. Then they take mathematical models from earthquake aftershocks. So you have one crime and they're kind of like aftershocks. Then this is the model that they use. And they are making predictions about uh, potential crimes that might happen down to 500 square feet. So in the city, they break it down to 50 square meters and they can say the likelihood of that a crime happens at a certain moment in this block. Uh, actually, 50 meters, that's actually the size of a classroom. So and then they tell the police patrols to drive certain routes. So the algorithm, police patrol has a, a monitor in their car and the algorithm tells them, drive to this corner right now. And the police patrol shows up there 
It's very difficult to say if they prevented something, but statistics shows that the police that use this predictive policing in these areas, crimes went down by 13 percent, burglaries went down by 11 percent, and car theft down by 8 percent, while at the same time in neighboring districts, actually crimes went up. So there seems to be some effect to you know, this prediction of where crimes might happen. They use this in many kind of applications in, in, in police and, and judicial work. For example, homicide parole candidates, very delicate issue. So they use the data set of 60,000 different crimes. They worked with 300 different predictors, big data source, the nature of the crime, the age of the person turned out to be a very important predictor. You know, elder criminals, are, they all convert more to doves than, than to hawks. The repetition, their behavior in prisons, a big data source. And they were able to predict with 60 to 7% accuracy if a convicted murder would re-engage into homicide or be involved into homicide once released from prison. Now, if you know, if an algorithm tells you that there's a 60, 70% of chance that this person will be re-involved into homicide once we release this person from prison, would you give him homicide parole or not? Well, interesting, if you don't, you basically punish this person, but did the person do anything? No, it didn't. It's just an algorithm that told you that it might, but would you release this person? Well, that's an interesting question, right? How did we do it before the big data age? Well, before the big data age, we asked a psychologist of, you know, you think this person we could release, and nowadays we like, we ask algorithms, and we can show that algorithms in many aspects are much more accurate than human judgments, than human psychological judgments, but kind of like, it's still funny, right? We don't like the idea that an algorithm now suddenly punishes us. Actually, there is a movie, Minority Report, which, which was about a similar logic where actually we had this pre-punishment was proposed in this movie with Tom Cruise, where people were, it was predicted that these people were making a crime through some oracle, and then these people were pre-punished before they already undertook the crime because, of course, if you can make very accurate predition, predictions, we don't have to wait for this crime to happen. But should we pre-punish people? Uh, it's an interesting question, right? But thinking about it, actually, a lot of pre-punishing already happens, despite of the fact that usually we have a free will and can still decide to do the right thing. For example, if you are a young man and you have a sports car, you're very likely to pay much higher insurance than a young mother. Why? Well, because it's predicted that the young mother will drive much more careful than a young man with a sports car. So you already punished by paying higher premiums on your insurance. And why are you pre-punished? Well, because of a prediction. It's still your free will. You are still free to choose to drive very carefully, but we're already in this era of pre-punishment. This big data footprint is so real, it looks so real because it's a footprint of what really happens that we often confuse reality with these kind of data proxies, with a digital footprint, with a shadow. We confuse the footprint with the foot and then we take actions on it and punish people. For example, if you apply to a visa, here this uh, cartoon says that uh, the visa personnel, the immigration personnel says, well, your recent Amazon purchases, tweet scores, and location history makes you 23.5% welcome here. And you might get a visa or not, according to your digital data footprint. So really tough decisions are taken based on your footprint. Now, this can save lives on the one hand, because we can make predictions, like in the case of, of a homicide. On the other hand, you know, it's also a little delicate, especially if you take the ultimate decision diapers and even immigration. But if you take the ultimate decision, that means you use the digital big data footprint to kill somebody. That's something you cannot revert afterwards. And for example, drone operators, what, what drones often do is they look for mobile phones, they track mobile phones of terrorists, and then they kill, well, they shoot at the mobile phone. So they kill the mobile phone. Well, as a JSAC drone operator said, it's of course assumed that the phone belongs to a human being who is nefarious and considered an unlawful enemy combatant. To say it in the words of the former NSA and CIA director, we kill people based on metadata. 
metadata means just data about data. So they are proxy data about data and we kill people based on that. Or to say it again with the words of the drone operator, and this is where it gets very shady. We take the ultimate decision of killing based on the digital big data footprint. And that's also a, cons a consideration that we have to deal with in big data. The footprint is still the footprint. It is not reality.